Thank you. I'm going to try and keep this as general as possible because obviously you're here with much younger children. But it is nice to know that you're planning ahead, um, especially because preparing for U.S. higher education uh, does take much more time. Ideally, you should be getting started by year 10 in the U.K. So earlier is fine, but really by year 10 you need to know what you're going to do. Um, I'm going to start by asking if there's anyone in here whose child will have dual U.S. citizenship. Okay. Um, just so that you understand, everything that I'm going to say is applicable to you as well. The only difference with having a blue passport is that you are then eligible for all um, financial awards, scholarships, aid, etc. In fact, your child can go into a bank in the U.S. and get a guaranteed federal student loan much lower interest rates, so that's handy to know. But other than that, they will be treated as an international applicant, regardless. Even if they go to the American school here, they'll still be treated as an international applicant. A few things that you need to understand um, is, first of all, there are just under 4,000 institutions of higher education in the United States compared to 116 in the UK. And that makes things very confusing. Uh, the term college, university, and school are used interchangeably. So throughout this discussion, it's just natural for me to go between them. If somebody says that they're in school in the States, you just look at how tall they are to figure out what that actually means. Historically, there was a difference between a college and a university, and technically there still is. But it's not something that you need to concern yourself with. Um, in the past, you went to a college for your undergraduate degree, for your bachelor's degree, and then you had to go to a university to get your master's or your PhD. Um, but a name that most of you probably know is Harvard, and actually if you go to Harvard as an undergraduate, you're going to Harvard College. So don't let that confuse you. Um, most importantly, I think coming from the UK, where there's a great deal of concern about prestige and ranking, um, please understand, there are no rankings in the United States. None. The only ranking system that you will encounter will come from a company that's trying to sell you a book or a magazine. So you have to take all of those with a, a very large grain of salt if you're going to look at them, and I know that you will. Uh, probably the more well-known one would be the U.S. News and World Report and the Princeton Review. Um, but once again, the criteria that they use in their ranking systems is not likely to be how you would judge the quality of an institution. For example, all of those rankers use as one of their five criteria the amount of money that graduates give back to the institution as a measure of a, the quality of the institution. And that's bizarre. Their thinking is that obviously if you were happy and had a good experience that you're more likely to donate money, but just because you're happy doesn't necessarily mean that you got a valuable education. So please be warned. Also, a lot of very good uh, institutions will not participate in any type of ranking research. So you'll never see them. And I'll give you an example. Most of you are probably familiar with the term Ivy League. Um, Ivy League means nothing more than an athletic conference. Um, however, when the Ivy League was established, it, and it's still true today, they are only East Coast schools. But also when they started, they were only for white men. So if you were a woman or a person of color, you didn't have access to the Ivy League. So a group of schools known as the Seven Sisters were established, and those were for women. And so each of the male Ivy League schools, in effect, had a sister school. So in terms of quality and caliber and reputation, you can think of them as being equal. One of those, well, all of them still exist today. Uh, most of them are no longer single sex, although a few still are. But one, for example, would be Sarah Lawrence. Sarah Lawrence was one of the original Seven Sisters schools. You will never find Sarah Lawrence in any ranking. Even though 
in, in your terms, you can think of it as being an equivalent to the modern Ivy League, they just won't rank because they refuse to give the data um, to the organizations that are trying to sell products. So please be warned. I, I think in the past few years, the, the reason for the increase of interest in attending university in the United States um, has been brought about by a couple things. Uh, first of all, the, the introduction of fees in the UK. And if you have young children, it's probably likely that by the time they're going to be going to university, it's going to be much more expensive than the current 9,000 pound cap, probably close to 20 or 25,000. And therefore, it's going to level the playing field a bit more in terms of what the US charges. But more importantly, the money, I think the biggest driver has to do with 17 and 18 year olds not knowing what it is that they want to do, not knowing what subject they want to study. I know a lot of 40 year olds who are in the same position, but um, because of that, in the UK, I hope that you understand, most of you probably were educated here, when you apply to university, you actually apply to a particular course. You're not applying to a university, you're applying for that particular course. And the application is actually very simple. Very brief biographical information, um, a record of the courses that you took at GCSE and A-level, or if you're doing IB or pre-U, et cetera. And then one statement of 4,000 characters or 37 lines in which you demonstrate your passion for a particular subject without ever using the word passion. It's very much black and white. You know, the offers that students receive, first of all, generally are conditional based on their results. So going into the process, the students know how many UCAS points or what grades a particular college or university is going to want for that particular course. So there's much less guesswork. And then assuming that they get what was the condition, the grades, the UCAS points, then they go. It's not the way that the US works. The US is actually a holistic process. So there are many more components to the application and hence the need to begin preparation much, much earlier. So let's start with what's part of the, the U.S. application. Um, I better stop because some of you probably have heard of something called the common application. Of the 4,000 institutions of higher education, about 600 of them use something that's called the common application. The common application is similar to the UCAS application in that you only need to complete it once and then it gets distributed to the schools that you want to see it. All right. However, only 600 of the 4,000 use it. Notable exceptions would include places like MIT or Georgetown or the state of California system schools, which would include Berkeley, UCLA, et cetera, which most of you have probably heard of. Um, but it's, let's work with the common application because even if the school doesn't use the common app, the requirements and the forms will look very similar. The common app will ask for a lot of biographical information, not only about the student, but they're gonna to wanna to know about you, the parents. They're gonna to wanna to know about the siblings. They're gonna to wanna to know where you went to university. They're going to want to know how much money you make. And don't get nervous about this. It, nothing that you put down is going to hurt you, all right? However, it may help you, and you might not have any clue that it was going to help you. The same with the questions that they're going to ask about your ethnicity and your religious affiliation, etc. Don't panic. Answer. The reason for that is that in the US, universities have institutional priorities, meaning there are, in every year, goals that they want to meet. And the goal of a US university is to bring together as diverse a community as possible that still matches with their particular ethos. So right this year, one of those big priorities is students who are what they call first generation, meaning their parents didn't attend university. 
So if you put down, oh, I feel bad, I didn't go to, you know, no, actually this year that's going to help you, all right? And same thing if you're Jewish and you're applying to a school in, well, actually right now there's one in Tennessee that's actively looking for Jewish students, it's gonna help, but you wouldn't know that. And by the way, it's not gonna help if you're applying to schools in New York, but um, other than that, things like that can, can be very useful. So all of this biographical information and family information, then they're gonna ask, obviously, about the student's academic background. And, and don't be fooled thinking because the US process is holistic that academics aren't as important. Of course they are. The academics are still going to be the foundation of the application. So what GCSEs did the student do? What A-levels did they do? Did they do IB? Did they stretch themselves? And I must point out, your children will never be penalized based on their environment. So for example, all of the brand name schools will say, we will take a British student with, we're expecting three A-levels. They're lying. They actually are looking for four or five. But a lot of schools in the UK limit the amount of A-levels a student can do. There are many schools that say, no, three, and that's it. That doesn't put your child at a disadvantage because your child will be viewed in context of the environment from which they come. So at that school, part of the, the paperwork that the school has to supply to the university is information about the school and, and the population of the school. So don't panic, all right? Um, in addition to the academic information, they are, in the Common App, going to ask for one main essay. Now, these essays are very different and tend to be very difficult for British applicants because they're not used to, to thinking or responding to what we would call reflective essays. And what they're looking for in these essays is, well, obviously, first of all, to find out if the student can write well enough. Um, but more importantly, they're trying to find out what's important to the student. So I'll give you an example of a topic from last year. Um, the students were asked in 650 words or less to describe the place where they feel most content. Now, they didn't want 650 words of description about the actual place. What they're really trying to find out is why. Why do you feel content there? All right. um, and I'll give you an example where kids can make a mistake. I had a student who wrote an, actually a very beautiful essay about he was most content in a little fishing boat up in the lakes, all by himself, secluded, and we learned that it, what was important to him really was the idea if he got, that's how he relieved his stress and, and how he got to focus, et cetera. Unfortunately, the young man was applying to New York University. Not a good match. <laughs> Not gonna work. So we had to change that. Um, so there will be that essay component. Then there will be possibly the request for a standardized test. And that is something many of you may have heard called the SAT. It's not, it's not SATs, it's SAT or ACT. And the only way I can quickly describe the SAT or the ACT would be to say it would be like the 11 plus on acid. It's intense and it's difficult and it takes a long time especially for students from here who aren't used to that type of testing because it's all multiple choice, et cetera. It's difficult and that really, that preparation should begin at probably in between years 10 and 11, but definitely once they finish their GCSEs. Right? And that will give them adequate time to prepare. Some universities also ask for something which is called an SAT subject test. Now, those aren't so bad because they're just like regular exams, but you do need to be aware of that because it will impact the amount of planning that you're going to have to do. And I will tell you this now, it is far better to invest your time and money in preparation versus multiple testing. Because 
even though many schools claim that they only look at the best results, they're not really telling you the truth. If you took the test seven times and you took it once and you both had the same scores, well, obviously I'm going to lean towards you. All right. On top of that, they're going to ask for at least one what they call a counselor reference. A counselor reference isn't all about you. It's similar to the UCAS reference in that it's about you academically, it's about your extracurricular activities, and it's about you as a person. In addition, it's likely that they're going to need academic references written by teachers who've taught them in class about what they're like as a student in class. Right? So, and there are also other documents that the schools have to prepare. You'll hear the terms transcript, et cetera. That's not for you to be concerned with. It is something that the school has to prepare, but you need to give them time to do it, especially if they don't get many US applicants. Um, then the US application is going to ask about your life outside of the classroom. What else do you do? And it can be school clubs, it can be sports, it can be community service. Um, some of you may have heard that in the past they wanted a little bit of everything. Well, that would be nice, but that really isn't the case anymore. They would much rather see a student involved in two or three activities over a longer period of time and activities that demonstrate what they call initiative and leadership versus I belong to this club and I went there once when I was in year 10 and then I joined this club and I went there twice. That's not how it works. They want long-term involvement. All right. Now, that's the main application. However, you're not finished. Each university in, that uses the common application will also, also has the ability to ask you to complete a supplement application. Now, some schools you might get lucky and they'll say, well, we don't really want anything else. But it's more likely that they're going to ask for additional essays or short answers. And these can be very time consuming. Many, 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 many years ago when I went to university, the essay I had to write for the supplement was and by the way, at that time it was 5,000 words. You are a crayon, what color are you? It worked for me, I was an English major. All right. Didn't work for the engineers. All right. My point here is that as you look through the supplements, you, that's the university's opportunity to share their personality with you. If your son or daughter looks at that question and thinks, ugh, Welcome to the next four years of your life. All right. So I'll give you another current example. The University of Chicago, which is a great, great institution. Same acceptance rate as Harvard. So that's how difficult it is. The University of Chicago, well, Chicago, so that you know, is the capital in the US for aspiring comedians. So if you want to be a comedian, you go to Chicago to that's where you begin. So if you've ever seen Saturday Night Live, et cetera, most of them started in Second City in the Chicago scene. So Chicago's essay last year was, at the University of Chicago, we appreciate humor. Discuss your favorite joke without ruining it. Now that tells you a lot about a Chicago kid, a, a University of Chicago kid. Very, very bright, but quirky. All right. A few years ago, the, the, their supplemental essay was, where's Wally? Okay. All right. So that then becomes the, the, the total application. Um, the time frame, um, generally most applications are due around January the 1st of the year that you wish to enter. So when your students get to year 13, they will submit all of their applications by January the 1st. They will then get their answers by the end of March, and they have until May to decide where they have to go. And hopefully you have many offers. But I want to talk to you about the realities. 
Um, in admissions in the US, we want to bring together the best class that we can. And we're looking at a lot of different things. We're looking at geography, well, outside of the academic and the application. We also are talking about diversity of so socioeconomic groups, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of where the students are coming from. Uh, this is not to imply that there's any type of quota system. There isn't. There absolutely isn't. But you must recognize that if I apply to University X, I'm a member of the general applicant pool. So let's say they're allowed to bring in 1,000 students and 30,000 have applied. I'm competing against all 30,000, but as an international applicant, I have additional layers of competition. So first, I'm competing against the kids from out of the country. Then I'll be competing against the kids from the UK. Then I'll be potentially competing against the kids from my own school, et cetera. So I raise this so that you understand in any publication that you might see about this, the admission rates, whatever the number is for your children, cut it in half. So last year, for example, the acceptance rate at Stanford University was 5% your chances are about two and a half. And there are other reasons why it's so low. For example, um, oh, and I get asked this a lot, sports. Sports are big business at US universities. So, for example, where I went for undergraduate, the football, the American football stadium, sat 110,000 spectators. So you can do the mats, the, the, the ticket sales, the concessions, the television rights, et cetera. Um, it, it brings in a lot of money to the university. But the good thing about that is that the American football team has to share the money that they bring in with the girls golf team in terms of providing scholarship opportunities. Um, and so there is potentially money um, and scholarship for that. But please note, um, Students have to be very realistic about where they stand in terms of competition. A few years, well, several years ago now, I worked um, with the British number one ranked shot putter girl. And I thought this is gonna be easy until we realized she wasn't good enough for any team in the States. Even though she was number one here, she just couldn't put, or whatever they do with it, far enough to make her competitive in the States. All right, and I get a lot of times little boys this big tell me they're gonna play basketball. No. Um, I will tell you sports that are particularly good, there tend to be for British applicants, golf. Um, if, a, if a young man has a, a handicap of scratch or below, he'll get a full scholarship. Um, tennis, if they're internationally ranked, they have to be internationally ranked. Any other sport, they have to be playing at least at county level, all right? And for some reason, anything in a boat. If your children are young, put them in the boat today and start rowing. There is a god-awful amount of money for people in boats. Okay. So, in terms of the financial aspects, yes, it is true. U.S. higher education, on paper, is much more expensive. So, we're looking this year at approximately on average, and some will be much less and a couple will be a bit more, but on average, a price tag of about 60,000 US dollars per year. However, that figure is all inclusive. That is everything. That is fees, that is accommodation, that is food, that's medical insurance. That also generally incorporates the idea of one round trip airfare ticket home each year. So if you actually do the maths, I think that you will find, and especially if the fees here continue to rise, that you're not necessarily going to be spending more than you think. In fact, I do such a good job as, at this, my daughter stayed here, and it hurt me financially compared to what would have happened if she'd gone to the States. And her fees at the point were capped at 3000 And it, it, it's not that, it's the living expenses. You know, you cannot get a flat or a residency hall in the UK, I don't care where it is, for less than 100 pounds a week, 
because they gouge students. It's just the nature of the beast. So many, many years ago when I was at Fulbright, so let's say about 15 years ago, um, the Financial Times did an article comparing students that stayed in the UK, and at the time there were no fees, with those that went to the US, and they found that the students that went to the US came out of university with less debt than their counterparts who stayed here. Right, so, and once again, there, in addition to the athletic scholarships, uh, there are a lot of um, scholarship opportunities from the academic perspective, or if your child has particular talents in arts or music, et cetera. Um, but it becomes more complicated, and I don't want to, to, to mislead you, but there is money. Last thing on finances. In the US, they have something that's called need-blind admissions. And for international students, not those with the blue passport, there are only five need-blind universities. Princeton, Harvard, Yale, MIT, and Amherst. And what that means is in the discussion for admission at a need-blind institution, when you apply, you turn in two applications, one for admission and one for money. At a need-blind school, they don't look at them together. So if I'm in the admissions committee and I say, oh, what a lovely child, yes, we accept. And then I turn over the finance document and it says, this family can afford to pay five pence per year. That's all I charge them. And I don't change my mind. It has nothing to do with the other. But as I said, 4,000 institutions, five need blind. The rest are likely to be what we call need sensitive. So they look at those two applications together. So I know when I'm discussing you how much money you would expect from my institution in order for you to attend. And I have to be honest with you, they get a lot of qualified British applicants who aren't asking for money. So depending on the school, you have to think very carefully. Now, you can apply for financial aid at one school and not at another. So you can play the game. But obviously, the more competitive the institution, the less likely it is that you will be successful if you are also applying for financial aid. Right. Now, one last thing that you need to understand about how they choose. See, the, the biggest problem here is that students take this personally, and it's not personal. You know? And you may think your child is special, but admissions doesn't necessarily think so. And sometimes you might be a fantastic applicant. Really, I want you. But I already have someone like you. So it's nothing that you've done. It's not, you have the grades, you've got the test scores, you've got everything I asked for. I still have to reject you, all right? And that happens a lot. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes what happens in admissions thinking is that, let's say I'm at University A, and I read your application, I think, God, this is a great kid. But, but I feel you actually probably are likely applying to University B. So I'm going to pass on you. And at University B, he's thinking, oh, I bet this student's probably applying to University A. And so they dismiss you. All right? So a lot of times, bad decisions are made. You know, it is a far more subjective process. It is a far more subjective process. But that's why it's important, if you do begin this journey, that you have to be realistic. You know, I love when people come up to me and say, well, we're applying to the States as a safety. The acceptance rate at Oxford and Cambridge is 22%. The acceptance rate at Stanford was 5%. Harvard, 6%, et cetera. So this is not the safety route. But within that, when you do, if you're gonna go through this, please make sure that you give yourself the spread that is necessary. You know, you can't, if you come to me and say, I'm only applying to the Ivy League schools, well, then you're an idiot. Because, first of all, you couldn't be happy at Yale 
and Dartmouth or Harvard because each one of those schools has a very, very different personality. Not, and, and also, obviously, their physical locations. Are you a city kid? Are you a country kid? What kind, you, you couldn't possibly. And, and that will come through in their applications. You know, you can smell it if a kid's applying to me because he likes my name or if he actually wants to come here. Time is it. I'm gonna get yelled at if I go much longer. Um, Dan? Yo, yeah, should I just add, if I add a couple of things on to what Anthony has just been talking about and then perhaps pass the microphone around for any questions that people have. Um, I think for the finances, one of the big things is that American universities are, are very much set up for the student. So there are work, there are kind of student working areas where unlike the UK where a student often has to choose between maintaining a full-time job, let's say footlocker for the sake of argument, um, and running the risk by not showing up for a, a shift of losing that job, um, that doesn't happen in the States. So very, you know, you can have a, I used to carry sofas on a Thursday for two hours, then on Sunday, and then when it came to finals, I would say I can't work for the next four weeks, I have to study. So the setup, the all, around, all about setup for students in the States is very, very geared towards allowing students both to focus on their studies, which is the crucial and the, you know, the reason they're following an undergraduate career, and the universities help students support themselves financially while that's going, out, while that's going on without distracting from their studies. So I think that's a worthwhile yeah, point. That's true. I want to go back to the very beginning, though, just so that you understand. I said one of the biggest reasons why the U.S. was becoming more popular was the idea of not having to pick a course to apply to. The reason for that is that most U.S. universities follow what's called a liberal arts approach to higher education. And basically, what that means is that you can think of the U.S. degree as having three parts. One third of the student's time will be spent fulfilling what we call the core liberal art requirements. So all students will be doing a little English, a little history, a little science, a foreign language, etc. And the reason for that is twofold. Number one, they want to allow students time to try subjects before they have to commit. So for example, in this country, you could very easily major in anthropology at university. Well, who's had anthropology at A level or below? It's just not possible. In the States, you get to try it, all right? The, the second reason is the, the, the goal is that students then get exposed to the way the practitioners in different fields think with the long-term goal of recognizing that it's unlikely that they will start a career and continue that for the rest of their life anymore. The statistic now is that our children are gonna have at least seven different careers. The other statistic is that 50% of jobs that will exist in 2025 do not exist today. So if they've only studied one particular subject or discipline, how are they, well, I'm sure that they will, but the, the, the liberal arts ethos says that it should make life much easier. So that's one third of your time. Usually students don't have to commit to what they call the major, here it's called the course, until the end of their second year. So that that becomes the second third, your major, whatever the subject is. The final third is perhaps the most fun. It could be a double major. Now in the UK there are dual degrees but they are always complementary. So it's quite easy to do law with the foreign language or business with the foreign language or literature with theater studies, etc. In the States, the only rule is do they offer it? So a student could major in physics and double major in modern dance. And Anthony, can I just add that the, I mean, the, the, the average undergraduate student in the States changes their major three times throughout the course of an undergraduate career. So if you compare that to the UK where applying to a course and then changing your mind, because you are 17 or 18 and haven't quite decided, not only is there no guarantee that you can change course, you can. there's certainly no guarantee that you have a place at the same university on a different course. So one of the huge advantages to pick up on Anthony's first point is the, the flexibility of interest, 
and, and you know, finding what a student's good at throughout the course and, and changing in line with that, which is a, a huge difference to the UK. The US operates also a policy of what they call continuous and multiple assessment during undergraduate degree. So never ever would a student arrive in their final year of study not knowing what, what they're about to achieve. The UK degree tends to have the first year as a, a platform to go on to your second year. The second year tends to represent 40% of your degree classification and really everything comes down to that final set of exams in your third year. In the US, every set of classes you do, which can be on a semester or a quarter system, so every six weeks, um, there's an assessment, the student knows pretty much where they stand and can either continue and go to the next stage of that course or change if for some reason they don't, they're not interested or the, the assessment style doesn't work. Uh, Anthony used to lecture and had, a, I think you assessed once by punctuality, is that, is that right? Not quite so silly, but um, it, it is continuous. So there's never just one indicator of success. If a professor came in and said, for the next 15 weeks, the only evaluation that I'm going to use is the exam at the end of the 15 weeks, he or she would be fired. It's just not acceptable. It, it just, it contradicts uh, pedagogy. So, um, that final third, so I, I can finish up with it, is you can double major, you can do what's called a minor. A minor is a concentration in a subject, but not to the depth of a major. So you could study physics and minor in German and business whatever you like. Or that final third could simply be, I wanted to try it. So I wanted to try Mandarin, but only for 15 weeks, and then that's it. Um, actually, in, in reality, the final third goes back to what Dan mentioned, that on average, students at UAC universities change their major three times. Now, let's say, for example, I start off thinking I'm going to major in literature, English literature. And at the end of the second semester, so the first year, I awake and recognize that I don't like to read. Not a good major. I want to be a chemist. Starting the next semester, you can become a chemist. So what you do is you take those classes that you did that were literature and dump them into the final third. All right, but please recognize that third is only a third, so you can't swell it more than that. I mean, U.S. universities are not gonna kick you out if you keep changing your mind, as long as you're paying. But, <laughs> but you don't want that to happen. Okay, the two, um, the two exceptions to everything we've said are, are medicine and law, which are exclusively postgraduate um, degrees in the States, but everything we've said applies to undergraduate study up to now.